Hi, welcome everybody to another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. Today's episode is number 43 on our weekly woodworking podcast, so that puts us in our second decade. Today's episode is all about insurance for your shop, as well as our weekly check-in on our current projects that we're working on. I'm your host, Phil Huber, and I'm joined today by the usual cast of suspects, incumbent Logan Whitmer and challenger John Doyle. This episode of Shop Notes Podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Plans. You'll find nearly a thousand plans covering everything that you'd want to build. From furniture projects to gift projects, kitchen accessories, workshop projects and jigs and more. Find your next project at woodsmithplans.com. Okay, so if there's one topic that woodworkers, hobbyist woodworkers like to discuss um, over a cup of coffee with other woodworkers is the possibility of going pro in some format. Uh, I thought you were going to talk about AARP. Well, there's that also. <laughs> okay. But that's just a given. They've okay. already used their AARP card <laughs> to buy their coffee <laughs> at a little Ooh. bit of a discount. So, uh, but that isn't really what we're talking about today but it's related in the sense that one of the things I think woodworkers don't think about is insurance. Yep. And you have kind of a sad story that goes with this. Yeah. So uh, one of our <laughs> listeners, Jim, uh, you know, I've met him a couple of times. Uh, he's the one that pulled the camper here for me. Uh, unfortunately this week, his, uh, he had a fire in his shop. Um, and, it looked like he was going to maybe be able to save some of his tools. Um, so uh, he ba basically he rents a shop. Uh, he rents shop space, and he had a. Uh, if I remember correctly, he had a kiln in there that he believes is what started it, like the heating element. Like I don't know if the heating element shorted out or something. Um, but anyways, uh, it, it caused the fire. Uh, luckily, Jim was uh, there. Uh, he was. Um, it was at night is when the fire happened and, uh, he was in, uh, his camper that was next to the shop sleeping and he, he woke up smelling the smoke. So he, uh, he was able to extinguish the fire. I don't know. I guess I don't know if he did or if, if they called somebody, um, but, uh, it caused pretty significant damage, uh, to the point where, you know, a lot of his tools were, were black. <laughs> I mean, you, you didn't know what brand they were. Um, and initially I, I think he said he was going to be able to save some of them, um, because he did not have insurance on his shop. Uh, however, you know, talking with him, you know, just this morning, it sounds like he, uh, his homeowner's insurance is going to cover a lot of his tools, which is good. Um, mm -hmm. you know, he said he did lose, you know, a significant amount of lumber and slabs and stuff. Uh, luckily he knows a guy, uh, <laughs> that, can supply some. Where, where were you last night? <laughs> I know, right? Uh, supply and demand. Yep. Uh, but, you know, it was an, it, it made for interesting thought process uh, for me. And we've talked about it. If I remember right, we talked about this a little bit in the mag, in a magazine article. Uh, it's probably been a year ago. I think Brian Nelson wrote it. And I think it was like a shop. I could be wrong, Phil. Correct me if I am wrong. Uh, it's like a shop app article, like a yeah. Smart... It was a it was about a, taking inventory of what you have in your shop. Yes, um, and putting it together. I think Brian's angle was to do it with because he's old school. Was yep. using Excel and creating a spreadsheet of oh yeah the yeah. items in your shop yep. and then being able to uh, take photos of all the items. Yep. Um, and then having a record of it, because if you don't have a record of it, then you're you're already down in the count when it comes to trying to get an insurance reimbursement on it. Sure. So I guess so. So for those keeping track at home, keeping score at home, that was in Woodsmith issue two thirty seven or the June two thousand eighteen issue, pages sixty yeah. sixty one, about taking inventory. So everybody turn to that uh, page right now. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Text, in your textbook. <laughs> uh, so I guess, I guess my question is, 
uh, for for you guys, for our listeners, is at what point do you decide that you need to add additional insurance? Um, you know, I think most of us are uh, in a situation where our shops are at our house, right? Um, our shops are, you know, uh, in the garage, in the basement. And I think homeowner's insurance would cover a majority of that. However, you know, we all have several thousand dollars of tools, right? I mean, it's very, uh, it, it adds up very quickly, especially if you have a claim like that. And you may not be able to replace everything you had. Um, so I guess, when do you look at getting additional insurance for the, for, for your shop? Yeah, I, I guess I have, would probably have more questions than answers on this topic. I haven't thought about it too much because I'm, I work in like my detached garage. So I always, you know, thought of it as part of my home. And in the past, before this pandemic, I did most of my work here and I wasn't like, you know, super set up there, but now. I've been working at home a lot. I have a lot more stuff there. So I guess the only insurance I've ever really considered is my wife had me sign a life insurance policy <laughs> and then sent me out to the shop. And it's like, it's, she's super Was there supportive. an anvil above the yeah, door? <laughs> super supportive of my woodworking now and spend more time out there, you know? So she leaves the car running in the garage, you know, to keep me warm. <laughs> until i get sleepy so other than that you know <laughs> all right <laughs> i think the big thing would be to look at your homeowner's insurance policy to see mm -hmm. what exactly you have you know because you're part of your homeowner's policy has a contents value mm -hmm. attached to it that's usually sort of based off the value of the house mm -hmm. and you can always raise that contents value yeah more if you wanted to i think the other thing to think about is um is if you have things itemized in there is to check to see whether your policy will replace a, the a brand new item for what you lose or just mm -hmm. give you cash value for well sort of cash value for the items that you lose you know mm -hmm. so it's like sure. you have a you know, like I have several old tools in here, my drill press and bandsaw. You know, I would, it's not like I would necessarily, if those were damaged, destroyed in a fire, I would want those replaced. But am I going to get the $25 back for what the drill press cost me? Or am I going to get $800 in order yeah. to replace the drill press? Right. Yeah, which that I guess that is a good question. And like John said, this might just raise more questions because most our insurance agents, thank God, uh, <laughs> it, it may raise more questions than answers. But th I think it's a good thing to uh, for our listeners to to think about and maybe ask their insurance agents, hey, what happens if I have um, you know rags in my shop that combust? You know, I think that's probably right. one of the more common things that happen or, or flood or, or theft, you know, even I think theft is probably a fairly common one. Um, if people know you have a shop, um, and what's your address again, <laughs> no, <right. laughs> where you keep these thousands of dollars of tools, that... <laughs> they're in my house. You gotta get through there without waking you me up. You gotta get so. through all this security. Uh, yes. Well, and yeah. by security, he means like weaving through endless piles of lumber in the yard. Yeah. So correct. You gotta do it without tipping a log over. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a maze. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, it's, I guess, and this whole thing takes a different path when you start talking about having an external shop, right? Or a, a shop offsite. Mm -hmm. um, right. Because that's, that's something I have thought about in the past. Um, you know, initially, when, when I built this house, I, I decided to put my shop in the basement. Uh, and when I finished the room I'm in, I... I I finished it like a theater room. So I have, you know, speaker wires pulled and stuff like that. So at some point, if I build an external shop, I can turn this into like a theater room or something, an entertainment room for the kids. Um, and I thought about how it would be pretty nice to be able to rent a building. You know, Phil, you teach at somebody's shop here in town that yeah. that's what they do. They rent or they actually own a portion of a building. 
right. if I remember correctly. Uh, but it's like, God, that would be really nice to have like an offsite uh, shop location. You know, there's convenience having it on your property, but you know, I think it takes a the, the insurance takes a completely different route when it is off site. And I think that's more uh, the more important time to look at insurance. Right. You know, because I think most people with their homeowners insurance have some form of umbrella coverage that's going to cover a lot of stuff uh, if something unfortunate would happen. Um, however, you know, once you start moving off site, that's when you do have to start, I think, looking at additional storage. Um, so I guess, you know, for you guys, is it worth the additional expense to say, you know, hey, I, I feel like I need to increase my insurance a little, you know, it might be an extra 30 or $40 a month to make sure I have coverage on my shop items. Is that worth it in your guys' opinion? Uh, I think it would be if I had more what I would call valuable stuff. Okay. So it's hard to say because right now I feel like my current coverage based on when we set it up would take care of my um, replacement of getting some things mm -hmm. now there. Sure. And, but I also know for the fact that if something catastrophic were to happen to my workshop and I would lose largely everything, mm -hmm. um, there's stuff that just wouldn't get replaced. Right. I'd end sure. up, or wouldn't get replaced right away and I would slowly build it back up again. Sure. Would that be a um a would that be because of you don't use it as much? You don't see a need to replace it that quickly, or would that be more of a, you know, you'd have more important things to take care of? I think it's probably more of the there's probably more important things that I would put ahead of Sure. Replacing than to replace certain items in my shop. You know, sure. like yeah. what do you put on a value for like your workbench if you build yeah. one, you know, True. or my tool cabinet or, you know, router table, you know, things like, you know, stuff that I've built, you know. Well, yeah, I, and that's how do I do that? And that's an interesting question. Because, um, you know, I don't think none of us have what I would call <laughs> I don't think any of us have what we call an heirloom bench, right? I mean, we don't, right. I don't think, and I might be wrong, but I don't think any of us have, you know, thousands of dollars invested in our bench like some people do. Um, but still, building a bench is a large investment in time and materials. Right. So, you know, it's stuff like that that, you know, we're, we're kind of talking about the big power tools and stuff, but the shop furniture is a large portion of your shop value as well, you know? Oh, yeah. And I, and I think it's worth having that discussion with your insurance agent and say, Hey, you know, here's the, here's the things I've bought, but here's the things I've built and the replacement cost on those as well. You know, I need to make sure I'm covered for those. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think there's probably two common viewpoints about insurance and especially something like this is a the assumption that it's just covered like i have a homeowner's sure. insurance policy right. so it's covered maybe maybe not and the other yep. one the other viewpoint i would say is insurance is a scam and <laughs> i'm just not gonna deal with it so yeah. yeah which i mean you know Tell it to everybody that ended up with trees on their houses in <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> they might still say insurance is a scam. <laughs> well, and I mean, even the last couple of years, cruising, you know, because we live in a social media age where we just know more about more people, you know, yeah. how many woodworkers have shown up on Facebook or Instagram showing photos of their burned down house and garage? You know, yeah. like granted, they have they're trying to rebuild their entire lives now. And the shop, right. is, you know, unless it's part of your livelihood is a sad but secondary issue. But still, mm -hmm. you know, you know, to roll back up to your house. Well, even in Iowa here where we've had either the derecho or floods, you know, like last year, parts of western Iowa, there were houses underwater for three months, you know, yep. like. 
that's going to mess with your stuff. Mm-hmm. Yep, for sure. So, yeah, and I guess that's a, another good question is if if insurance does give you replacement costs on stuff. Um, so, you know, for example, I have a, a saw stop table saw. If I had a fire in here and my, my table replaced or they gave me replacement cost for my saw stop, do you try to save that tool or do you just cash it in and get a new one? You know, because I, and I guess it depends on what, what disaster I'm, I'm calling these a disaster, what happens to it? Yeah. You know, like I think fire is probably one of the worst ones <clears throat> because mm-hmm. you get a lot of heat and stresses and stuff's going to warp and twist and stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, Flood but, that's in a basement could be pretty bad. Yeah, it could be. Gets into electronics, especially with the saw stop. Yeah, yeah I would imagine avoid like, the the mechanism warranty right. or depends on how complicated mechanism you know electrical right things are in there because even a fire would toast a lot of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I believe so as well. So just something I mean it's something that we don't necessarily want to think about, but I think it's something that people should at least consider at some point, you know, um, especially in 2020, man, like <laughs> yeah, you never know what's going to happen. I mean, we've only got a couple months left. What could possibly happen <laughs> <Right>. now? <laughs> you know, uh, the yeah. movie rain of fire happened in 2020. So dragons are probably coming. Oh, so, dragons. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot about that. Coming before or after the locust. I don't know. Probably after the locust, they have to eat something okay. to grow up. So, right. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, you know, on the, on the note of insurance, uh, you know, it, I, I think if somebody is doing that full time, um, if you're a professional worker in full time, I think you have to have insurance at that point. Right. Like yeah. some form of insurance. Um, I know I've, I have a quote, uh, from my insurance agent for, um, my sawmill. So for going, like a liability insurance quote. Mm-hmm. So yeah. if I'm out milling at somebody's house and something happens, you know, um, yeah, so I'm covered for that. Um, uh, but you know, it's just one of those things that it's that medicine you gotta, you kind of gotta take at least yep. consider taking it. At Cost some point. of doing business. Oh. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I know that, uh, you know, Nancy Hiller has done a bunch of writing and speaking about, you know, folks who want to go pro. You know, it's really easy to think about getting paid for the woodworking you do and, you know, somebody's paying you to spend time in your shop. True, but you also need to pay somebody to make sure that your shop is protected. Yeah. You know, whether it's insurance or permitting or liability or liability and taxes and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. And that and the whole insurance thing changes completely uh, once you add an employee. Oh yeah, you know. Yeah. So once you once you add a helper, um, you know, when I was going through the quoting process for my sawmilling, it's like, oh, do you ever have, you know, an employee with you? It's like, well, I have a helper occasionally. Uh, they're like, oh, that's a whole different ball of wax. <laughs> like, oh, great. No, and I don't like, have a helper no, ever. Never <laughs> had help. <laughs> nope. It's an independent, unpaid intern contractor. contractor. Yes, right. yeah. exactly. So it's the yeah. Uber of sawmill loaders. Yes. <laughs> Log dash. That's what it's called. That's, uh... So if there's anybody out there listening to the podcast and has made it this far, A, good on you. B, we're sorry. And C, if you have any knowledge about insurance, we'd love to hear about it. Mm-hmm. Yes. I would expect that we have an insurance agent that listens, right? Oh, I'm sure. So yeah. I would love to hear from. Yeah, I would say you, if you are on um, YouTube or however you want to contact, I would say you know comment any questions you have on the subject, and also if you have any knowledge on the subject, and then <laughs> right because we go the, from if, there because this this could be a if anything thing. these last twenty minutes have shown is that we don't really have knowledge <laughs> on this subject. It's just we have a bunch of questions, some lived experience, and and an interest yeah. to learn in it. So yeah. uh, we'd probably even have you on the show too. Just yeah. answer some questions, guess. talk about it. and That'd be cool. Yeah. See what we got. Because I think there's a lot of stuff in here that just doesn't, you know, it's like 
that's not really any of the chapters in your setting up shop books that you find. Nope. It's like chapter two, insurance. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody would buy the book. <laughs> <sighs> that's funny. Yeah. So maybe next episode could be sponsored by Farmers or State Farm or mm -hmm. Allstate. Yes. We can nationwide. get Jake. Yeah. From State Farm. Ooh, yeah. yeah, Jake from State Farm. Yeah. yeah. Or the guy from the Farmers commercials. He's pretty fun. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. No, I think int uh, I've vacillated back and forth between the, the assumption and the scam of insurance. And I think where I got the scam part was uh, when... Uh, my wife and I were in the process of getting married is like the engagement ring and the wedding ring and other jewelry mm -hmm. and adding riders for this and a high value that. And, mm -hmm. you know, at some of it, it sounds like, you know, in three years of paying this insurance, I've essentially paid the replacement cost of what exactly. this item Great. is. So, yeah. How about I just save that money somewhere? And maybe that's an aspect of it too to consider is self just set a self well, self insurance in the sense that you have um, I don't know, an emergency fund yeah. or a set aside or whatever where it's for your shop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. that you don't have to pay that monthly cost. However, you are still not planning on a disaster, but planning to Prepared. cope with a disaster. Yeah. Yeah. I think insurance is one of those things. It's like you're paying a small ish amount to cover, you know, a large disaster that you wouldn't be able to pick up, you know, yeah. just at this a spur of the moment type thing. That's like to yeah. cover you from that. No one's ever going to make money or profit off of, you know, insure like it's a business that's not set up for the the purchaser of the policy to come out on top. It's there to cover you like in major things. You're still going to lose your deductible. You're going to lose your premium if something yeah. happens. But if you had, you know, a $10,000 loss, it's going to, you know, help you cover part of that to yeah. start again. Yeah. So, and so that you don't have nothing. to start from zero. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. But. So. All right. Well, I'm going to email my insurance agent after this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jordan, will you be on the Shop Notes podcast? You may have heard of it. Yeah, yeah. We have a million questions. <laughs> and he's like, no, I have not heard of it. <laughs> the what now who? <laughs> is that like a ham radio thing? Or? Uh, yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. So in the meantime, everyone's homework is to inventory their shops. Yes. Take pictures, write it down, keep that inventory someplace safe that's not in your shop. So when it burns down, the inventory doesn't <laughs> burn yeah. with it. So I mean, And hide it from your significant other if you right. have more tools than they know about. Right. <laughs> Code the value of the tools so you yes. can only... <laughs> you can you need your decoder ring for yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, as easy yeah. as it is now with smartphones to be able to put together a photo album of yeah, you know, yeah. and it's not like everything needs to be a magazine cutout background photo on right. a sweep. You know, you just go around and take vignette shots of the different parts of your shop that just mm -hmm. show the items in it. Oh, heck, you could probably even just walk around and do a video. Do your own little yeah. personal shop oh, yeah. tour, you know? Yep. Put it up on YouTube as private so only you can see it, and then you have that stored digitally. You yeah. don't have to yep. keep it on your phone. Yep. So. so, I mean, the other thing to think about, too, is that it it's pretty easy to have sneaky value in stuff. Because, I mean, we're, we, we started off talking about you know, like a saw stop table saw or my thickness planer mm -hmm. or, you know, a nice band saw, you know, those are high dollar items, but I mean, you pull open your router bit drawer. Yeah. yeah. 
you know, it doesn't take long to that's several hundred dollars, mm -hmm. you know, thousand dollars, depending on how many router bits you have or, yeah, you know, do you go by kind of the current value of old tools, you know, like your hand planes behind you, Logan, like that's a yeah. lot of, that's you know, do you, money in hand planes. Yeah. do you want to replace all of those? You know, it's one of those things like, is it worth replacing if you were to lose it? Would it be bad to lose it? Yeah. Catastrophic? Not necessarily. Mm, you know, exactly, you yeah. could do a ton of woodworking without replacing every one of those items. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's kind of an interesting thing, too, because you're right. As much as I've said I'm not a tool collector, I mean, I have a collection of tools that I don't necessarily use every one of them you know, in a year, you know what I mean? Right. So, so yeah, it's one of those, like how, you know, would, how would I, you know, I have what, 30 different molding planes behind me. How did I, I guess I don't know. That's another question for our insurance agents. I mean, it's like, Hey, how do you replace value or how do you put a replacement value on that? You know? Yeah. Um, it's just, it's hard. And yeah. I know a lot of the times when I've added stuff to insurance, um, or, uh, had insurance claims they wanted receipts for them it's oh. like i i bought most of those at a garage market. sale yeah. yeah it's like how do you how do you value that and that and maybe that's where the spreadsheet comes in or it's like yeah. hey you know here's what i would value a replacement cost to be and i think there's probably of all these planes right here i probably have receipts on five of them you know what i mean <laughs> like my Lee Nielsen's and my, I, I bought one set of my molding planes from Jim Bode tools, Jim Bode tools. Oh, so yeah. I probably have an email receipt somewhere for that, those two. So it's like, yeah, just yeah. all these questions. Yeah. The other thing too is like, does depreci depreciation on some of these tools take into effect too? That's another question to ask yeah. your agent. Is it? replacement cost or is it you know depreciation come into effect and you're only getting you know so much off of a five-year-old tool or a ten-year-old tool or yeah. or what so yeah and when you ask these questions don't be real sneaky about it because they're gonna get suspicious <laughs> like <laughs> let's be like hey i want to cover my shop i have a bunch of questions <laughs> yeah how much do you value this uh, oily pile of rags in the corner <laughs> <laughs> that's starting to smolder. Well, you know, Phil was talking about, you know, how value can sneak up. I was just sitting, I'm sitting here looking at, I'm not going to spin my camera around because my shop is still a disaster, but looking at my two, I have two cabinets in here that have finishes in them. Yeah. Like there's several hundred dollars in finishes. Oh yeah. So it's like, I don't yeah, that's, that just adds up. And I don't know if consumables like that would be counted right. in. Yeah. So. Like, I probably have, like, a 401K's worth of, you know, tiny scrap pieces of wood. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Throw away. I mean, how do you value that? <laughs> like, I can't throw a bit of that away. Right. You know, every piece. So. Yeah. All right. Is that horse dead? I think that's a good topic. Yeah. That's something yeah. to think about. We'll so. have to pick back up on that. Yeah. So for anybody who's listening, I would love to have your questions and comments. Number one, is your shop specially insured? Do you have you thought about that? B, why or why not? And if there are any other insurance agents out there listening, or you've had this podcast forwarded to you, and you're like, who the heck are these guys? We'd still love to hear your comments on it. So you can <laughs> make the comments on our wood YouTube channel for the Woodsmith Shop. Or you can email us, woodsmith at woodsmith.com. So, in light of that, how are you guys doing on spending time in your shop? Um, I've been back in my shop this week. It's been nice weather here, 70 degrees yeah. in early November. And so, get it while we can. So, I've been out there. I don't know what I've been doing, kind of just making messes and cleaning them up and <laughs> whatnot. Does everything really get done? So, yeah. Just These make, are questions. Yeah. Different piles of stuff. So, but. yeah. Well, you know, like you said, it was 70 degrees out. So uh, I took Monday and Tuesday off and 
uh, went out and ran the sawmill for two days. Um, made a lot of sawdust, cut some what, ash, some hackberry, and some. I found a sugar maple in this log pile. Um, found a couple big limbs from it, so I cut those. And then the the trunk was too big. It was 50, 50 inches in diameter. The thing was holy huge. crap. Yeah, and sugar maple grows slow, so that had to have been an old tree. Um, but we pulled it out with a skid steer. And there's a there's a gentleman that lives north of me, about five miles. Uh, he he has a swing blade mill, so he's gonna go out and do that one because it's just so big. Um, so yeah, I was doing that on uh, earlier part of this week. Um, in the last two days, or I guess yesterday and the day before, uh, we were in the the studio a little bit, snuck away into the shop for some lathe time. So if you guys are looking on YouTube been turning some little uh, sea urchin ornaments. I don't know if uh, that's mm. oh, showing yeah, that's up cool. real well. So I thought, it was a um, tiny, I thought it was a tiny mace where you can like, yeah, it is. Know, like, it is. It's a tiny <laughs> little, yes. Weapon. It's a mace for my uh, little action figures. <laughs> Very good. But uh, yeah, if, if anybody uh, has seen the sea urchin ornaments, um, there's a bunch of people that make them. Um, I've been playing around with uh, kind of practicing my finials. Um, that kind of which is a little bit of, of a departure for you because you're not much of a spindle turner. No, and it's funny because I've always had zero interest in spindle spindle turning. Like I like bowls and platters. Like that's what I love. But this is addictive too. Like this is fun. <laughs> so I did uh, this one. I did. I didn't. I didn't finish this one before you left the shop last night, Phil. So I finished it up this morning. Uh, it's a tiny little ebony one. Oh, that's cool. Um, which was super fun. This is it's first time I've turned ebony. And even though a little pen blank of ebony this size only costs like what four bucks, you're still like I don't want to screw it up because it's ebony. So yeah. So yeah, just a tiny little finial, if you guys can see that. Uh, mm -hmm. So that one will go on a, a urchin shell, and I have to turn the top still. So, are so yeah, the, that's been. Did uh, you find the urchins yourself, like on trips, or they you just order them somewhere? I ordered them. Um, I ordered them, and I could be wrong on this uh, this website, uh, but we'll I'll throw a link in the show notes or Phil will. Uh, Richard, I think it is RichardsSeashells.com. So I think the guy's down in like Florida uh, and he just deals in seashells. You can buy all different types of seashells from him and they're dirt cheap. I mean, I think these bigger seashell or these bigger urchin shells here, uh, I think we're like 75 cents a piece. Oh, really? Yeah. And the the little ones I bought, which thankfully were, were very inexpensive because a couple of them broke on the way here um were like 40 cents a piece i mean you spend more in shipping than you do on the actual product yeah shouldn't uh, the but, website but be cool. she sells you would, she you would think sells so. she seashells by the oh. she shore she shore yes. <laughs> dot com uh, mm -hmm. yeah uh I think but i, I actually I, I found that website from uh there's a guy uh on youtube he has his youtube show now uh he used to have a show i think on pbs as well tim yoder it was uh wood turning oh, with tim um, I was watching his YouTube making these guys. Uh, so that's the website he used. So that's just what I, what I grabbed and used. So, so I've been messing with those a little bit. And I also, this is gonna be surprising to both of you. I've collected a couple pieces of wood that I'm super excited about. I know it's a surprise. I think last week I talked about trading, um, my dado stack for some teak, right? Sure. So I got six of these guys. These are the teak. Um, so they're not huge. They're three inches wide or so and about 16 inches long, uh, rough cut one inch thick teak. Who knows why this guy had these, um, or he, he got them from a, a guy who got them from a guy and somehow ended up with a bunch of them. So I got six of those, which is super cool. And this is the one I'm really excited about. Um, this is a big old, if you guys can see that. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a uh, piece of um, Buckeye Burl. So this is a big 24 inch by 25 inch round um, of Buckeye Burl. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm turning it into a clock. Well, <laughs> it's not going to be a clock, but it is going to get turned into something. Um, 
I'm going like to literally that... turned. Yes. Yes. It is. Uh, I'm taking that down with me in January. Um, to and then we're going to turn it into a big um uh like a wall hanging shield basically hmm. where you uh you turn it you patina it you gold leaf and copper leaf it in some areas and it, it when it's finished and hanging on the wall it looks like a you know roman shield that you dug out of the ground so pretty cool so i'm actually gonna this is wet um this was uh this is like i said 24 by 25 it's two inches thick um, and it was, tell me, tell me what you guys think. It was $175 is what I paid for it. It's a big piece of burl. It was green. So it's sopping wet still, um, dry. I have seen the Buckeye burl that size go for five or $600. Um, so I thought it was a fairly decent price on it. Okay. And I had, I mean, I had to ship it in from. Washington State or Oregon or somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. Not uh, Ohio? Not Ohio. No, you'd think the Buckeye would come from Ohio. Yeah. Uh, but um, it was it was more than I've ever spent on a piece of wood. You know what I mean? Yeah. But pound I, for pound, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Board foot-wise, it was more. Um, but I think for the, the circumstance, what I'm doing with it, I think it'll work. So I wasn't terribly concerned about, you know, spending that money. I mean, that was a couple hours running the sawmill will pay for it. So it wasn't that big a deal, uh, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, I'm actually going to, uh, I'm working with somebody here in town that has a kiln. Uh, I'm going to go throw it in their kiln to dry it um, because it is 30% moisture right now. I want it down to about 10 before I take it to Las Vegas where it's super dry and going to crack probably. So <laughs> So, yeah. Speaking of kiln. Yes. Speaking of kiln. Um, so, yeah, I, I was super excited. I'm kind of, I, I don't try not to be a wood hoarder, but God, I can't help it. <laughs> it's an addiction. Yeah. Phil, how's All your right, super secret see. thing coming along? Uh, I've been applying some spray finish just to add a little sheen to it. So I think the the construction part is done and I'm down to the hardware. And I kind of have a mishmash of hardware that uh, I'm putting on it. So okay. um, I'm, some of it is kind of a black iron look to it. Others is some reclaimed hardware so that I've been aging chemically to match that black look. And then another piece of hardware I'm spray painting. So nice. Cool. It'll at least look. I'm hoping that I can actually start doing final assembly and hardware installation uh, in the next couple of days here. So it'd be nice to have that one wrapped up. So are you gifting this is it at Thanksgiving or Christmas or when is this? Uh, at Thanksgiving. Okay. So in cool. a, just okay, so people a have to wait of, three weeks. Couple yep. of short weeks before I can do the big reveal on it. I'll see if I can get some nice photos taken before and mm -hmm. so. That one, the finishing on it has taken quite a while on it. So, and by quite a while, it means that I'm lazy. And when we had a cold snap, it's not like I'm going to be able to finish out in my workshop. So it's like yeah. shuttling stuff downstairs and then I back out and that kind of yeah. thing. So, well, well, everything and everything you were using was water based, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So that's good. You're able to finish it in the basement. Right. Not that that's ever stopped me from using oil-based finishes in my basement, but, you know. No, and I've done that, too, but I've tried to be pretty <clears throat> judicious on what I'm doing yeah. with oil-based finishes downstairs. Mostly, sure. not necessarily because I'm worried about blowing up something with the pilot light on the water heater, but it's more just the lingering stink that, you know, yeah. that comes from it. So if you give me yeah. just a second, I'm going to grab a couple other things that I've been working on here. Sure. Okay. Yeah, it seems like I've done some stuff like at home with an oil finish on it. And I thought I left, let it like cure long enough in the garage and I'll put it in the car the night before I'm going to bring it into work. And then I get in the car in the morning and it's just like, oh, oh, stinks. I always do that with spray lacquer. Like I'll yeah, spray oh, yeah. something with lacquer at, in the shop and in the our big finishing room, you're like, oh, OK, it's gone. Yeah, it's and then gas. you put it in the 
yeah, you put it in the like in the car or the truck, and it's like, holy cow! Yeah. Like this thing yeah. stinks. Like a week yeah. later, it still stinks. Yeah, I tried to leave you know stuff at work to dry for like a week, and still, it's like seems like it's off gassing for you know weeks after. So. Yeah. So uh, last week I showed uh, Christmas ornaments that I made for a fun project that we've been doing in conjunction with Popular Woodworking, and they're cardinal ornaments based off the work of Charlie Harper. And I was showing them to my sister's-in-law and where we'll be spending Christmas time, and they really liked them, so... We thought what we would do is, and I've made cut out a bunch more of the ornaments, mm -hmm. and we're going to do them as grandkid craft activities. Well, that'll be fun, yeah. For the for the kids, so the grandkids are kind of divided into two halves of like a really younger set and then an older set. So for the younger <clears throat> ones, <clears throat> it'll be most just a painting project because they're all at the mm -hmm. age that they can paint, and then the older ones, I thought. I would have it that they could, I would show them some basic knife skills on softening the edges and then uh, gluing the tail into the body and then doing the painting on it. So anyway, so I have that. And then my, uh, my sister-in-law, uh, for her mom, bought a, <clears throat> bought a Matawi tile. We've shown their tiles oh, sure. in several mm -hmm. of our projects. One was a clock and also that big wardrobe that Chris did. Yep. <clears throat> so she got the tile and wanted wanted a holder for it. So I'm making a like a shelf display rack. So I have a some really tight grained Douglas fir that I got from Brian Nelson years ago. And I thought I'd make the make a holder for for the tile. So it's kind of a display stand that she can keep on the bookshelf, so. Nice. Yeah. So I'll, right now it's just a blank with a couple of guidelines on it, but I'll keep you posted on what, how that's been going. Yeah. And I've been feeling, you know, like last week I said I was taking more time to be out in my shop and I've been feeling more inspired. So I put together a big list of stuff that I would really like to do yet. Mm -hmm. or over the winter so that's been kind of fun to feel excited and energized and and yet at the same time trying to temper that with hey finish the projects you have going before you start another one I'm yeah. looking at you <laughs> I'm looking at you dylan baker <laughs> i thought you were looking directly at me <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's where i thought he was going with it too but i mean valid point dylan's you know ambitious he is <clears throat> So I feel like I'm stockpiling projects for a long winter here. You know, right. That are just like <laughs> stuck in my shop. It's like, oh, look at all this stuff I have. These are your buried acorns yeah. of projects. Yeah. It's stockpiling like, oh, projects for the, the, the alleged second wave of the COVID that was supposed to be, it's supposed to be coming. Yeah. Yep. I'm ready. So. I'm ready for lockdown. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's lock down 2.0. <laughs> Maybe by then my shop will be clean and they can do stuff in it. Yeah. I think I think my my problem with this is I it all started with that stupid vice stand. And I was like, oh, this would be great to move all this stuff. But then I started moving stuff. I'm like, well, crap, I need to build this cart to put all this stuff in. And then I need the second stand to put this on. And then I need this shelf to put these other things on. So it's just like this never ending like loop of needing to build stuff for the stuff that's in here on the floor. <laughs> right. <laughs> Dang it. Yeah. You got to use all that space. That's up higher. Yeah. You know, hang stuff from your ceiling and put it on the walls. It's yeah. So much stuff on the plus side. There's a really cool YouTube video of your shop tour. Once it's all done. That is true. Wow. And you know, I did promise that in my saw stop assembly video and I never did it. So yeah, once I once I get all this stuff moved, I think we'll we'll do a cool YouTube shop tour. Yeah, you did one, right, Phil? Yeah, I did. Yeah, so. yep. Yeah. So that's out on YouTube. John, think, have you done one? I haven't. I'm the same with you. Is like as soon as I get this set up or clean to a point where I'm not embarrassed by it anymore, <laughs> then then I can have company. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, you just got to set a deadline. Ending. 
Yeah. Set a deadline for it. What's nice about it is, I mean, on the one hand, it comes across as a little bit of a vanity project to do a video on your shop. But on the other hand, it was interesting to do the video and to think, oh, I really made some deliberate decisions as to why I have things in the Mm -hmm. places that they're in and, you know, to kind of go through that or be reminded of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think as a woodworker, I'm always interested to see what other people are doing in their shops or have set up in their shops. Like when we get photographs, um, like reader's tip submissions, they, you know, they're taking pictures of what the tip was, but we're always like, Oh, what's that over there on the wall? Or, Oh, look how they set up this. Or I'm the same way too. When we're Mm. out on a neighborhood walk with the family, you know, there'll be people (laughs) with their garage doors open working on stuff. And I'm just kind of like, yeah, looking in the garage and And your wife is like, quit staring in there. I'm like, I'm going to look if they have the garage door open. Right. I just want to see what's going on. So, yeah. Well, yeah. See, now that we're talking about this, I'm looking around like I need, I'm going to move that and move that. Stop! Stop! I just need to. Don't pick at it. Just take no. everything out to the yard. Yep. And then like get it all figured <laughs> one, out and bring it back in. One third you donate, one third you throw away, and one third you keep. Yep. <sighs> Not that yeah. it's a hoarders episode. <laughs> Might as well be. Jeez. The way this is going. <laughs> All right, it looks like we've come to the end of another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. Thanks for listening, everybody. If you have any questions, comments, or smart remarks, we'd really like to hear them. We may even read them. You can email us at woodsmith at woodsmith.com, or you can submit the questions or comments on our YouTube page where you'll find the video version of this podcast. Otherwise, wherever you're listening to it, we'd love for you to give a good review and a rating to help the Shop Notes podcast get in front of more woodworkers like you. Otherwise, we'll see you again next time. Bye, everybody. This episode of the Shop Notes podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Magazine. Woodsmith Magazine has been the trusted source for all your woodworking information for over 40 years. From tips and techniques to furniture projects to shop projects, you'll find it all at Woodsmith Magazine. Subscribe today at woodsmith.com. Incumbent Logan Whitmer, and challenger, John Doyle. Yes. I hope okay. that's one of the of me flexing. Yeah, <laughs> me too. So everybody can laugh at me. <laughs> Get off the screen, fatty. <laughs> <laughs>